You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast, brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today, we're looking at some future player projection type of things, starting with the Southeast Division, Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. This probably has more use for people in dynasty leagues, and of course, this is very, very far from an exact science. We're just trying to look at some of the young guys. Don't want to cover every player on the team, but for a lot of these teams in this division, there are a ton of young guys to talk about. Looking at what perhaps their future could look like, um, and where to sort of value them, any sort of guys that maybe don't have as high a ceiling as others predict or do have that really high ceiling. So let's uh, me stop talking about it, and let's start looking at these guys. Let's start with the Atlanta Hawks, a bunch of players on this team that fall into this category. Um the uh, first guy we're going to talk about, of course, here is Trey Young, who yeah is the seventh ranked player already this season. He's averaging almost thirty points and ten assists per game. I don't really see huge amounts changing for Young in the future. I don't know. Maybe he's not a thirty point per game scorer, and he probably isn't. That will probably fall off at some point, twenty seven, twenty eight, as the team starts to get better. But the field goal percentage, which is at under forty four, that can jump back up. Maybe he gets his steals up to one point five per game. Maybe he goes from a 36 to a 38% three-point shooter. They're all the, the things that I can see for Young. But he is locked in as a first-round guy from now for the next 7, 10 years, probably. That's how we should be viewing him. Probably a future top five player in fantasy would be my guess for Trey Young. The next player is really interesting, and that is Cam Reddish, who started out this season yeah, really, really poorly. He, he was not good at all. But now for the season, he's the 183rd ranked player. But it's because he has played significantly better of late. We have seen big... He was one of the most destructive players in basketball to begin this season. He really was was struggling with shooting, with a lot of things. But he was a guy that you know didn't necessarily like him as an NBA prospect. But I said I thought he could have good fantasy value in his career because he did two things. He shot threes with good volume and he got a lot of steals. And we've seen that translate across here into the NBA. I think he can be a consistent enough top 100 sort of a player. In fact, over the last two months, he is the 69th ranked player. Giggity! In fantasy, now it's only 10 games, but it's 16 points. He's shooting 50% from the field. He's at 85 from the line. He's hitting 39% of his threes, 59% of his twos. Now, there's probably going to be some drop off there, especially in the two-point shooting, but 1.3 steals, over two threes per game. He can be a consistent... um, top 100 sort of a player, someone who I value significantly higher than his rookie teammate, uh, DeAndre Hunter, I would look to uh, to Reddish to maybe have, uh, I think he's got a chance to be, have a couple of top 50 fantasy seasons in the future. We're probably talking you know, 2023, 2024 uh, as his peak sort of area, maybe even 2025 as peak Reddish time. And I think that's when we're looking at him as a, a top 40-ish type of a guy. If he can be an 18-point guy with two and a half to three threes and yeah, close to two steals, that's uh, interesting. He can pass the ball as well. He's not a terrible passer, although his assist numbers are rough this year. Definitely has a lot more statistical ability uh, than someone like uh, DeAndre Hunter. Kevin Herter, Fanta Pants. Been a bit of an interesting season for Fanta Pants so far this season. Had uh, the injuries to start the year, didn't begin the season on time, and then was a, a little bit rough. But he is 103rd ranked player overall this year. He's averaging 12, 4, and 4. And that, that 4 in the assist column is really what gets me interested about what Herter can do moving forward. And in fact, over his last 11 games, he's almost at 6 assists per game. Some backup point guard role, some secondary playmaker role next to Trey Young. He still isn't shooting the ball well, only at uh, under 42%, which is rough. 38% from three is good, but his twos, and this is the same problem that he had last year, just couldn't really finish around the rim. And that looks to be something that could hold him back. A lower usage guy, and it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out when this team is whole. When Capella comes back, where does Herder sort of fit into there? 
You know I like this guy. You know I think he can be a, a pretty strong uh, player, a, a strong starter on a team, and, and a solid enough fantasy guy. But in terms of overall upside, I'm not sure where he gets to. Uh, can he ever be a top 50 player? I reckon there is, that's probably going to be a bit of a stretch there for um for Kevin Herter. Yeah, this season he has been a negative overall in terms of PIPM. Now, so has someone like Cam Reddish, who's been a huge, huge negative there. Although that number for him, uh, Reddish, uh, negative 2.68 over the season, uh, over the last uh, 10 games is at negative 0.5. So it's been a big, big jump up, and I could see him taking huge steps forward in that area. Herder still has you know, some pretty big room for improvement, and I think that will come in the next couple of seasons. And I could be, see him being a 16-point-per-game scorer at some point throughout his uh, career in the next few years. And if he can get you know, five rebounds, five assists, you know, that's interesting. The steals is also what's going to really do it for us. Is he a one-steal-a-game guy? Or is it 0.9 this season? He was at 0.9 last year. Or can he get to 1.3, 1.4? That's going to be the real swing thing for him in terms of his overall fantasy value. I am not, as you're well aware, really all that interested in DeAndre Hunter as a long-term, uh, as a long-term fantasy guy. Uh, I just don't. I didn't see it with him really coming out of the draft. I don't really see it with him now. Nothing that he has done so far this season has made me think. Well, I was necessarily wrong about this guy. He's the 198th ranked player so far, despite playing 32 minutes a night, 12 points. Um, a guy that's played a lot of power forward, he's averaging under five rebounds, only 1.73s, 41% from the field, 76 from the line, 36% from three. The, the three-point shooting is okay. Like, it's not great. Uh, he has upped his rebound rate of late, definitely. He's at 7.6 over the last 10 games, so that's obviously a big improvement. But it's the shooting numbers, and it's the just absolute lack of defensive stats from Hunter. For a guy that came in as this defensive lockdown guy, we saw his numbers for Virginia. Went, well, is that the scheme they play? So you gave him a little bit of a pass there, but maybe not. 0.7 steals, 0.3 blocks. Really, really low numbers, and that's what concerns me for him. I'm not... I, I think that the chances of him ever being a top 100 guy are lower than him not. So I think the the majority odds or the, the the favorite there, if we're backing one each side, is that he never becomes a top 100 player. I think they should be looking to run with a young, Herder, Reddish, Collins, Capella combination and having Hunter play like a 25-minute role off the bench. I really don't see it for him uh, this season. He is a negative 1.82 PIPM, which again is not a great number. But um, yeah, there are plenty of people who will disagree with me on DeAndre Hunter and they think that he, uh, he, he can get better and he will get better. I've got no doubt he will improve to some degree. I'm just not sure it's going to be enough. I'm not going. To, I'm not sure he's going to be able to put up the sort of numbers that justify that fourth overall pick in the draft, or justify really the uh, the sort of fantasy value that some people think he can have. I had him down, I think, like 17 or 18 in my dynasty rookie ranks, and I don't think I'd really change that. Johnny Collins is a real interesting case because the whispers you hear out of the Hawks are that they're not sold on him. I think that you know, trying to run him at center would have been awesome, but the fact that he's been able to turn into a high, high-ish high volume three-point shooter, 40% on almost four attempts per game, is really interesting. He is the 12th ranked player this season, John Collins, on a per-game basis, averaging 22 and 10, 1.6 blocks, almost a steal, 58 and 80. Like He has got the makings of an excellent fantasy player. These are all the things that we saw from him in college as well. When he came out, it was crazy to me that he fell as far. A guy that I was massively into in terms of getting in dynasty leagues. And he's sort of lived up to all, all that uh, all that hype and probably exceeded it. I didn't think he'd be the 12th overall player where he is now. I think he can probably still get better in the next couple of seasons. Uh, it's probably going to come uh, just with consistency. Um, I think the three-point volume goes up. I think he can get to two made threes a game. I think he he can get you know, 22, 23 points a game. The rebounds and the blocks are going to be interesting to see how he fits with Capella. But I think we should be viewing Collins as a top 25 type dynasty player, probably higher, top 20. The Capella factor is interesting and you get the worry that that might push him into you know, the 30s in terms of overall rank. But I, I really like John Collins. Damian Jones. 
Uh, not a huge amount to say about Jonesy. He started some games this year, only averaged six points with four rebounds, 0.7 blocks in that time. Really high field goal percentage for Damian Jones, but he's not someone who I think is an NBA quality player, an NBA starter. And um, you know, with the Deadman and Capella pairing, he doesn't really have much future with the Hawks. I'm not really sure that he has too much of a future in the NBA in general. Uh, Jones is uh, going to be turning 25 in a couple of months' time, so he's not exactly super young. I don't think we need to look at him as any sort of breakout player. Bruno Fernando, I thought he's... Um, well, no, I thought I... Yes, his college translations came out really well heading into the NBA, but he has been a pretty big disappointment so far this season. He's had opportunities. He has played uh, 13 minutes a game, 4-4, four and four, low block numbers, low steals, bad free throw shooting, and he was a decent enough free throw shooter at Maryland as well. He just hasn't really, you know, the advanced stuff doesn't doesn't really like Bruno either this season, unfortunately for him. I thought there was an opportunity for him with only Alex Len really in front of him at center to be a starting center, and he did become the starting center for this team. Uh, it just hasn't translated into good fantasy numbers. Um, defensively, yeah, this, this is, he's been okay, but it hasn't been fantastic for Bruno. And offensively, he's just looked completely lost. Now, I think we can expect that to improve to a degree. And he does have more value than the 371st ranked player, which is where he currently is. But I think he more tops out uh, as someone who is yeah, maybe a top 200, top 250 sort of a player. And the last guy I want to talk about on the Hawks is Brandon Goodwin. Uh, point guard who I think has played pretty well this season. Um, Goodwin is a guy that was a, a two-way player. He's only played in 34 games in 13 minutes, but six points, uh, 1.5 assists, 40% shooting, 93% from the line, 30% from three. Nothing there it looks spectacular or anything from Brandon Goodwin, but I've just liked the way that he's gone about it. I like the way that he looks when he plays, and I know that's not really a scientific number. I thought he's held up okay defensively. There's been some moments from Goodwin that give you, I guess, marginal hope that he can stick as maybe a third point guard in the NBA. But I don't think he's someone that we should be banking on. He's already 24 as well. Not someone we should be banking on long-term to be any sort of difference maker. But I could see a two- or three-year at least career for Brandon Goodwin in the NBA. All right, on to the next team. Uh, that Talking about the Hawks took quite a while. So I don't. I was going to do all of these teams in one podcast. We've got tons of time, guys. So I might actually sp split this up so I'm not doing an hour and a half shows on each uh, division. So we'll see how many teams we get through and then we'll push that to another episode. Let's talk about the Orlando Magic. They don't have quite as many young players that I think we need to discuss here. Where there are guys who are sort of out of that dynasty type discussion. I, I probably could have included Aaron Gordon on this, but he feels like almost a finished product at this point. But they've got a lot of older guys for a, a team that's you know sort of pushing for the playoffs. They're, they don't have a huge young core of guys. Let's start with the guy they do have as a young player on this team, and that is Mo Bamba. One, two, three, four, five. Bumba's been a disappointment coming out of college, out of Texas. Second year in the NBA, he played last year uh, 16 minutes a game. It's gone down this year to under 15 minutes a game. He is scoring fewer points per game this year. He is, though, blocking shots at a really high rate, but the field goal percentage for a big man is rough. 47% from the field for Bumba. Now, I guess the impressive thing we look at there is he is shooting threes, uh, and he's hitting them at a better rate, 36% from deep. But 2% conversion is bad from Bumba, 53%. Um, at uh, as a two point converter, and he's not he's not out there you know, bombing away mid range king or anything like that. This is a guy seven foot tall who should be in there being able to do you know, a lot more than that uh, in close, and that is really dragging him down. Now the other thing that has happened to him is he has seen his um, uh, free throw percentage improve significantly. Now that was rough last season from Bumba. We saw him down under sixty percent. And that's always going to be a concern for fantasy. But this season, Bumba has been able to take it up a notch. He's at 67% from the line. He was at 59 last year. That is a big, big drop. Now, his free three, uh, sorry, big, big increase. His free throw rate has also dropped, which actually, when you're a negative free throw guy, it helps to... Um, it helps to see that sort of stuff drop down, but it has been um, it has been you know, pretty weird just to see how uh, how poor the overall shooting has been. Interestingly uh, enough, his 
uh, rim shooting numbers uh, are down to 60. He was at 74% last year. He's down to 63%, which is bad. He's not hitting his mid-ranges at all either. So that's what really needs to start changing from Bumba. He's also, uh, at least his shot profile has changed. He's taking fewer mid-range shots uh, and more at the rim. The problem is he's just not converting those shots. He is taking more threes, which is uh, which is a good thing, considering how much he has improved. But a lot of the metrics really love him, especially for his defensive numbers. And I think we look at him as a guy, it's not going to happen for a while. He's still young. He's still just age 21. It's more going to be when they do move away from Nikola Vucevic, who is 29 years of age. So two years' time maybe for Bumba, you could see him being the starter. But when Vuce went down this year, they didn't start Bumba, but they started Ken Birch because Bumba still has a lot of concerns, a lot of defensive issues. He's not very stout rebounding-wise. There are a lot of things that need to come. I don't think he can ever be a 30-plus minute-a-night player. I think he's more of a 26, 27 guy. But developing into a Clint Capella type of a player is a possibility, except he hits threes. Now, he's never going to be as high of a field goal percentage player as someone like Capella. But being in there... 26 minutes a night. Now, Capella's obviously like 34 minutes a night for the Rockets this season. We don't know what he's going to do with the Hawks. But Bumba coming in there, blocking shots. Like, he could be a really big two, two and a half blocks per game sort of a player. He's averaging uh, 3.5 blocks per 36, which is up from last season. He's actually at 4.4 blocks per 36 over his last 23 games. So that is a a big, big jump up. And I do think that we see in in three or four years' time, I think he's going to not have a very long career in terms of being good for a long time. Once he hits 30, he'd be well out of fantasy calculations. I think he's maybe going to have like a three or four year window that will start maybe age 24, maybe age 23 for him. So your three years time, three or four year peak that puts him maybe into top 60 type discussions as a three point bombing uh, shot blocker, we need to see that consistent improvement in free throws, but at least it is coming along the right direction at the moment for Mo Bamba. John Isaac, of course, is been ridiculous this season. He is the 34th ranked player in fantasy. He's out for the year with a knee injury. A lot of you playing seasons again. Oh, should I pick up John Isaac from when the season resumes? The season may not resume. Your season for fantasy should definitely not resume. Maybe Isaac comes back. In fact, the league said that he would be available to play, so they wouldn't. Gra- uh, they didn't grant them the disabled player uh, exception. But the Magic know they're not going anywhere, and they don't want to put any extra stress on Isaac. So maybe you could add him. But I wouldn't be uh, overly excited about it. Again, finish your bloody leagues. Isaac, only 12 points per game, but that's not why we have him for fantasy. 1.6 deals, 2.4 blocks, 7 boards. He hit a 3 per game as well. He can still start to improve in certain areas, I think, with his uh, with his shooting ability. Uh, 33% from deep. He was at 32 last year. Can he push to, he would never be a 40% guy, but 35, 36, maybe. The usage is the concern as well. He did up that to 18.6 this year from 16 last year. So that it's taking steps in the right direction. He'll never be a big assist player, but he could very easily be a triple one and a half player. He's already at one and a half steals and one and a half blocks, almost two and a half blocks. In fact, it's just getting those three point volume, uh, that three point volume up. I said uh, multiple times as a rookie, that I think he's going to be a top 50 player. Well, that's obviously been proven true because he's already a top 50 player. I think he can push further. I think he can push into the top 25. I'm not sure he goes any higher than that just because the offense and yeah, can he ever bring it to you know, 20 points per game? Very, very doubtful. But he's doing all this in under 30 minutes a game this season, Isaac. Like that is some ridiculous sort of stuff from him. And we would love to see him get you yeah, better. It's the offense, though, that is going to hold him back. I think he can take some steps forward in, in two or three years' time to see exactly where that uh, where that can go. But for now, we just have to say, well, we're getting our defensive numbers out of Isaac. That's exactly what we want. Uh, and then anything else that comes on top of that is a real bonus. And I think, again, that's where we should be sitting when looking at him and his value for this season. But he's been obviously really good, one of the, the steals of the draft. Now, he was a guy that I was massively into, and then his ADP started coming into 50. And I went, well, that's, that's a bit risky, considering he's never been a top 120 player before. But even if you took him around there, it's actually worked out for you. I was, I was all about taking him in the 80s and the 70s, but in that 50, 60 range, I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure how this is all going to work. But it obviously 
has worked out really, really well for him at, at this point, putting up some uh, some strong numbers for the season. And you know, the, the injuries are the concern with Johnny. Uh, hopefully, he's able to get himself right, and that's not too much of a long-term concern. Markel Fultz tweeted this out at the beginning of the season, and I still believed in Markel Fultz before we even knew he was going to play. Um, I think he's been solid. He's the 127th ranked player this season. We've got a full year out of him. I also said I thought he'd be their starting point guard. That happened earlier than I thought as well. 28 minutes a night he's played, 12, 3, and 5. If we basically, not basically, this is his first NBA season. I think that's not bad. Like he's shooting 47% from the field, 72 from the line. Only 25% from three. That needs to change. But he had significant worries about his shot all over the court. 47 and 72 is a real step forward. Now, what else can he do? The three-point volume is low. His usage is only 21%. And on a team that doesn't have many huge offensive usage guys, it's Vucevic and Fournier in the starting lineup. Even Aaron Gordon's got a, a low usage. You'd think he'd be able to do a little bit more. But I still see the flashes there from Fultz. I still see him as being someone who can step up. What we need from him, though, is something that we really saw in college is shot blocking. He's at 0.2 blocks per game. This is a guy who could get to Dwayne Wade, John Wall, Danny Green type levels as a shot blocker, an average 0.8, 0.9 per game, one block per game as a guard. And if he does that, that is where the top 50 comes from. 1.5 steals, one block per game, but he just isn't there at that point yet. I think we can see more aggression offensively. The passing, I think uh, there's a room for improvement, as in the rebounding. I think there's actually huge room for improvement here with Fultz. I think that we should be looking at him. Uh, a lot of the um, advanced stats, metrics, really love him uh, long-term. And I think if we look at him in you know, three or four years' time, I, I think that there is a better, much better than zero chance. I think maybe like a 20% chance that he is a top 30 player. I think there's a 50% chance that he is a top 50 player. Um, and I, I think we should be looking at him as, if someone has him and they don't fully believe that, which I think a lot of people will, but I think that he, I think his ceiling is probably higher than the majority of people uh, expect it to be. I think he can really, really top out at some uh, at some pretty strong numbers uh, overall, and um, he's going to be. The, well, I think they've found him as their point guard of the future. So Marco Fultz has been impressive to me this season. Let's go on to the next guy. It does get a little bit rough from here with the Magic. Wes Wundu, who's had opportunities to start this season with injuries to Fournier and to Isaac, and he really hasn't done anything in that time to make me think that he is uh, a player that we need to get all that excited about. I wouldn't be... He was already 25. I wouldn't be surprised if he's got like another two years or so left in the NBA. He's averaging just five points per game on under 40% shooting. There's not much happening with assists or rebounds or defensive numbers. Not really sure what he's good at. He's not hitting twos. Um, Awundu was a guy coming from Kansas State who had some pretty interesting statistical translations as well. It hasn't worked out that way. Defensively, I think he's held up pretty well, but it doesn't translate into defensive numbers, which is what we want for fantasy. Now, the defensive, the defensive play keeps him on the court, but the problem is it doesn't then translate into putting out, um, putting out the sort of numbers that we need in terms of steals and blocks. And then when he's on the court in those minutes, he's not really doing anything offensively, which is uh, which is a shame. But uh, I, I wouldn't do a guy. Uh, maybe, he gets, maybe he gets a second contract after this first one is done. I wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be banking on it completely. A guy who's been a, a really interesting player for a few years now uh, is Emil, Emil, Emil A. Jefferson. I can't. Ne I never really know how to say his name. I probably should uh, probably should look that one up because he is a guy that has put up some big numbers in the past. And he, again, one of those rookies who came in with some pretty strong uh, statistical translations coming out of college. He plays for their G League team. Um, if we have a look at what he did in the G League this season, for example. 26 points with 13 rebounds a game, 1.7 blocks. He's shooting 66% on his twos. He's not taking any threes at all, and his free throws have actually dipped. He was a 74% free throw shooter over his uh, G League career before this season. And look, he hasn't really done anything. I don't think he's even played in the NBA this season. But 
he is a name for us, I think, to watch at least longer term. Now, the Magic, there's been a lot of whispers about what they're doing with someone like Aaron Gordon, who um, struggled nearly all of this season and has uh, and has started to pick it up a little bit lately. Um, but he hasn't he hasn't really yet blossomed. Now Jefferson does play that same sort of well that he does play that same position. Now I'm, I'm just looking at this. I think they might have. Do they actually release release him? I think they might have uh, released him. Unfortunately, I, did I miss that news? Ha! Huh, hang on. Huh? Just a look. The Magic did release Amelia Jefferson. So apologies for that. But I still think he is someone to take a look at. I think you'll get picked up uh, and signed by someone if this season ever resumes or next year because he is a guy that has put up some pretty strong. Um, some pretty strong numbers. Now, he is 26. That is a bit of a problem there with him. Not a huge, massive upside sort of a player. But, um, yeah, a guy that yeah, puts up big numbers when he gets that opportunity. We just haven't seen that opportunity come. The last player I want to talk about for the Magic is Melvin Frazier, who was a second-round pick a couple of years ago and has really, really struggled to do anything so far this uh, in his NBA career. A guy that showed some real length in... Well, he shows length for every year because that's how his body looks. But in college, some real disruptive ability. Had a lot to work on offensively, and it hasn't really come so far. He's only played 15 games and three minutes a game, so his NBA sample is uh, is pretty small so far. Like we don't really know what to get what to get out of that. So those sort of numbers for him. Um, and his advanced stuff has been okay, but not really spectacular. I think he could have maybe an impact, and I'd like to see them try him over someone like Wes Wundu, but yeah, it's, it's just not enough there. Now, what he's done in the G League is interesting. 18 points per game, almost seven boards, but it's the 2.2 steals, and he averaged 1.6 steals last year in the G League. He's up to over half a block a game, but he's still, he's got to hit threes. Now, last season, he only attempted 2.2 threes per game in the G League. He's up to four over four this year. Now, he's hitting them only at 32%, but having that extra confidence, he's finishing the twos a lot better, 59% from two. It gives me some hope. If I'm weighing him versus a, an Awundu, I would take Frazier over him. I, I think he's got just that upside, especially with his ability to get steals, which we know can be a real fantasy turner, yeah, yeah, sort of category turner because it's a low-volume low one. So Frazier could be someone like that, that if he gets that opportunity, depending on what happens with their starter now, James Ennis or with Wes Awundu or with guys like the Chief al Aminu, Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. And they're guys on the wing. Terrence Ross is 29, Fournier is 27, and a free agent coming up. Ross just signed a deal. Michael Carter-Williams is 28. Uh, he's a, a, a free agent coming up as well. There are some opportunities if Frazier can develop, which is a big if, but he's not a complete write-off at this stage. Again, coming out of college with a pretty good reputation as someone that can be a disruptive 20-minute-a-night wing, and those steel numbers are what really should get us you know, interested in what he can do. All right, that'll do it for this show, guys. I'll be back to talk about the rest of the Southeast Division coming up. We're going to have plenty of time to discuss all of this stuff over the coming weeks and months. Don't forget, subscribe to this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.